Okay, <laughs> success. Great. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everybody for being here tonight. I appreciate your joining us and I think you're going to be very happy with the presentation these wonderful experts are going to share with us. I'm going to introduce them individually and I did notify you in our e-blast about who is speaking but I'll just go over again. We have Bob Borthwick is our first speaker. He's a award-winning landscape architect. He's probably very well known for his Avalon waterfront waterfront design and other public coastal projects, but Bob has worked on numerous Laguna Beach projects over the years, serves on several environmental nonprofit groups, <clears> and <throat> is well informed about the city's changing landscape. So Bob has a number of topics he's going to discuss, and so I will let him start and, and fill us in on his uh, issues. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Um, well, first off, I'd like to say that my photos images here are being run by Ann Kristoff uh, remotely in South Laguna. So hopefully we will be syncing up here uh, appropriately. Uh, so my talk tonight will be an overview <clears throat> of trees in Laguna, specifically in the lower canyon and downtown areas. So just like with art, architecture, or music, the more you know about a subject, the more you can appreciate it. When I was a kid growing up in the LA suburbs, I knew the difference between a pine tree, a palm tree, and maybe a liquid amber, which was in my backyard, <clears throat> but that was about it. Uh, it wasn't until I took my first tree identification class in college that I learned how to understand and appreciate the differences between these things called trees and a whole new world opened up for me. Just like with people, some species grow tall and slender like the lemon gum eucalyptus on Broadway, and some species grow short and stout like the red gum eucalyptus by the Village Green Park in South Guna. Aside from small shrubby trees like arroyo willows and scrub oaks, Laguna Beach has only two large native species, the California sycamore and the coast live oak. <clears throat> the California sycamore is the image that you see uh, on the screen. So, Ann, could we go to the next one? Um, so, from the toll road coming to town, there is a stand of large native sycamores in Sycamore Hills north of the toll road. And then smaller stands of eucalypt, or excuse me, uh, sycamores at Elcad, and other isolated specimen native sycamores all the way into downtown. Many sycamore trees in Laguna Canyon have been removed over the years to allow for development, especially in the Sun Valley neighborhood. As a natural watercourse, Laguna Creek provided the ideal environment for sycamores. Large historic sycamores are growing along the creek in Annalise, uh, Annalise School property at Willowbrook, Ganal Lumber, and elsewhere. One of the most beautiful native sycamores is in front of the water district downtown. Mm. It's humbling to think that these trees were here to shade the native people centuries before there was a town called Laguna Beach. Likewise, coastal live oaks grow naturally in shaded arroyos with groundwater. These are evergreen and form broad canopies on the hillsides, while sycamores are taller, deciduous, and form the punctuation points. Together, the oaks and sycamores, along with the green hills and natural rock outcrops, form the symphony that is Laguna Canyon. Laguna Creek was channelized in the area in front of the Boys and Girls Club in 1958. In the 1960s, the Laguna Beach Beautification Council led a plan to plant a row of Aleppo pine trees along the new channel to create a Christmas tree lane. This was a project of Al Trevino, who was uh, a, a prominent member of the Beautification Council. The last five of these original pine trees were removed last year as part of the channel reconstruction project. 
There were also two large sycamore trees removed for a total of seven trees to be demolished. In the original concept review plan submitted by the county, there were only seven small trees proposed for replanting, and these were in tree wells in the sidewalk. No trees were proposed for planting in the long linear parkway between the sidewalk and the channel where the pines were removed. It would have been a treeless wasteland had that initial plan prevailed. After public pushback about the lack of trees and with support from the city, Caltrans and the County Flood Control District finally agreed to planting approximately 35 new trees in the reconstruction project to replace the seven trees that were removed. Also, three of the four ma mature sycamore trees in the mini park were allowed to remain. Unfortunately, large native trees such as sycamores and oaks were not allowed to be replanted in the parkway area due to the proximity to the channel in the roadway. However, small native trees, smaller native trees like the Catalina cherry and Western redbud were allowed along with large native shrubs such as toyon and lemonade berry. The tall Dr. Seuss-like succulents are aloe, uh, are barberary tree aloes. And um, I am working with the city staff. A, lo a lot of people have mentioned to me that they feel that the, these clusters of three of these plants planted uh, equidistant apart looks kind of formal. So I am working with uh, Mark Trestick at the city to try and have a contract to relocate some of those so they're more informally spaced. Uh, the replanting of the mini park by the Boys and Girls Club is nearly complete. Uh, I'm working with public works staff uh, as a volunteer to, uh, to add additional low succulents and natives so that the park will look like it did 10 years ago when it was installed. Feel a lot, of, a lot of people have asked about the median islands. Uh, the bottle brush trees that were planted in the 1960s were not native, but they were alive, healthy, flowered in the springtime and provided a sense of scale to the street. Some of us wanted to keep at least a few of these trees, including Anne and, and Ruben on this panel, to supplement the new plantings and requested staff to consider this option. But Caltrans has a safety regulation about trees and medians not exceeding a certain trunk size. And those trees were considered a safety hazard. So they were removed. But we were able to save the two small coral gum eucalyptus trees in the median uh, at the Forest Avenue intersection because those trunks were, had not exceeded the, uh, the maximum dimension. So the new tree, the new trees in the medians are considered to be small to medium sized trees in the sort of 12 to 18 foot category height. And, uh, and they include Western redbud, Mexican elderberry and toyon. The lower shrubs and ground covers will be similar to the, to the new channel parkway and the village entrance. This, this is a Sambucus that uh, Mexican elderberry that's on the screen now. Mm. Uh, moving downstream into the village entrance, the primary trees in this design are California sycamore. Uh, that, that's a toy on there in the back with the red uh, berries, a big one. <laughs> uh, the primary trees in this design are California sycamores, Engelman oak, coastal live oak, Torrey pine, and western redbud again. The Engelman oaks are related to coastal live oaks and are native to Southern California. The Torrey pines are native to coastal San Diego County and the Western redbuds are native to the Southern California foothills. The redbud trees are the smallest in this group at the village entrance at approximately 10 to 18 feet mature height. They're deciduous and provide magenta flowers in the spring. They're a little stunted right now, but hopefully they'll they'll catch on. The sycamores are really doing uh, by far the best. 
Um, our downtown, so moving into the downtown from the village entrance, our, our downtown streetscape, oh, there's, there's the uh, redbud tree. Is there such a long delay before you see the, the trees? Uh, so um, anyway, our downtown streetscape is mostly unplanned and eclectic, like Laguna. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. One exception has been Forest Avenue. G George Rogers bought the 155 acres that included downtown and Canyon Acres in 1880 and planted hundreds of Australian eucalyptus trees from seed. The trees he planted were happened to be blue gums like you see at the uh, Sawdust Festival. Uh, he, he built his house where the city hall now stands and planted the California pepper tree there in 1881. The hundreds of eucalyptus trees on his property created a forest and that's how Forest Avenue was named. For over 100 years, the postcard image of downtown Laguna has been Lower Forest Avenue with its rustic row of eucalyptus street trees. Removing these existing trees, street trees, as currently proposed by the promenade planning, will change this historic streetscape, streetscape image and, in my opinion, should be carefully considered before final design decisions are made. I, to me, this, this look is... Um, um, you know, is is the money look for for Forest Avenue? Of course, this is Upper Forest, but Lower Forest looks similar. Um, so a, a, another uh, another eucalyptus species in downtown that's predominant is the lemon scented gum, Eucalyptus citriodora on Broadway. These trees were also planted in the nineteen fifties as part of a city beautification project. They were prized for their grace and beauty and soon became Laguna's official city tree. The view down Broadway to Main Beach has been captured in many paintings at the Festival of Arts. This same lemon gum species of eucalyptus frames the bell tower at the, at the Presbyterian Church and uh, at Second Street and Forest to create what Greg McGillivray has called one of the most beautiful views in all of Laguna. Mm -hmm. I would hardly agree with that. With Another our... dominant tree <laughs> species in downtown is the ficus nidida or Indian laurel. These trees were again part of the 1950s downtown beautification and were planted on Ocean Avenue, Third Street, Second Street and elsewhere. Ficus trees thrive in Mediterranean climates, and these trees have grown to become Laguna's signature downtown urban uh, shade trees. Ficus trees are, are known for surface rooting, but in deep, rich, sandy soils like downtown Laguna, their roots tend to go downward to the water table rather than outward. In 2013, a sidewalk repair project was removed several large ficus trees. I think there were five total that were removed. But after removal, it was discovered that the roots were not the severe problem that they were thought to be. I happened to be standing right next to one of them when it was pulled out of the ground at the uh, Presbyterian Church corner there. And uh, it was clear when the... When, the tree was pulled out. The roots were, were really not an issue, unfortunately, for the tree. Uh, so the last downtown tree we'll discuss is the California pepper tree. This tree species was brought to California from Peru by the missionaries. So it is not native to California, mm -hmm. even though it's called California pepper. It looks so bare there, doesn't the, it? The large historic uh, California pepper trees exist in large existing trees and exist in front of City Hall and in the Pepper Tree Park on Ocean Avenue, the site of our current holiday tree display. This species of pepper tree has a broad canopy shape similar to oak trees with drooping branches. 
Its cousin, the Brazilian pepper tree, often has a twisted branching structure, does not have drooping branches, and is not considered as graceful as the California pepper. But due to its smaller stature, it is common throughout older village neighborhoods like mine by Bluebird Park. And those uh, Brazilian peppers were especially popular in the 30s and 40s. That lady at the bottom. So uh, <laughs> I think somebody's not muted here. Other than, other than these eucalyptus, ficus, and pepper trees, the rest of the trees in downtown create a charming mix of species that also includes magnolias, New Zealand Christmas trees, Canary Island date palms, and others. This mix of species gives our town the informal character that we all know and love. And uh, so there's a California pepper and um, Metro Sideris on 2nd Street. And, uh, Ocean. I'm no, sorry, oh, so Ocean Avenue. I'm sorry, yeah. And uh, and this one is a, a date palm, Phoenix canariensis, uh, uh, that's in happens to be in Woods Cove, but that's the tree, the date palm that is in front of City Hall. And uh, there's on uh, Ocean the um, the magnolia that's in by um, the bagel shop. So. Anyway, I, I'm sorry this has been a slightly disjointed here as far as syncing up my text to the photos, but uh, there's a lot, a lot of trees in Laguna and a lot of topics to cover. And so I hope that this is for those that have a limited knowledge of uh, some of our popular trees, I hope this is uh, some help. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Bob. And so if you have some questions for Bob or regarding the, uh, you know, any of the downtown trees, if you want to put them in chat for now, we'll get to them. But uh, for the next program speaker, we have Anne Kristoff. Uh, many of you are familiar with Anne. I would like to ask, there's a couple of you that are not muted, that we're having some background noise interruption. So I, I'm not sure who it is. There's some iPhone people tuning in. So if you can check your speakers and mute yourselves. And Irene, I think you're not muted. And I think that's about uh, Julie. If you, Julie Poston, Stam mute yourself. I think that would be helpful to our audience to hear the next speaker. So thank you again, Bob. That was wonderful. You're obviously an expert. If I took a walk with you downtown, you could tell me every single tree we walk by. So, okay. And another award-winning landscape architect and is, you know, a specialist in historic projects and native plants. She has served as a city council member, a mayor. She has worked on city landscape projects, and she is a frequent contributor to uh, agenda items at city council. So we really appreciate all of Anne's input for the community and her talk tonight. So Anne, I hope you're ready to launch into your presentation. All right. So thanks to everybody for, for coming. It looks like we have over 50 people on our call. That's wonderful. And as I worked on this, I I realized that we have an ever-changing relationship with trees. And the, it started out at first with the people in Laguna loving trees and needing trees and planting trees, such as the eucalyptus that were planted by the early homesteaders starting in 1870. And this is downtown with the eucalyptus that Bob was talking about. This was before they were paving the street. And this is kind of the, this is the environment that these early residents were facing. You can see that it was quite barren and they really, they really went all out in planting trees. And you can see in the center there, um, how many trees uh, were were planted. Part of that is the forest that of a forest avenue 
in addition, the in the 1920s, the women's club took on beautification and they 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 asked Florence Yock, the daughter of of um, Joseph Yock, who was running the Hotel Laguna at that time, to give them a list of recommended plant uh, trees to plant. And she she gave them a substantial list. And they also did a campaign to plant Monterey Cypress. One, one year they gave away hundreds of Monterey Cypress to residents to, to plant throughout the town. Unfortunately, most of those did not survive because of the climate not being quite right. But we still have some beauties that are still here. In, in the 1930s, uh, there was the South Coast Improvement Association and it was the depression, they got a grant from California's version of the WPA to plant the red flowering eucalyptus on, on uh, Eagle Rock Way in South Laguna and also trees along Coast Highway. So they were doing an aggressive effort to, to bring more trees, more life, more color to our community. These are the trees on Ocean Avenue that Bob was talking about that in the 50s, 60s, the beautification committee was active and they they planted the ficus, the tall eucalyptus and, and many other trees throughout town. They also preserved trees. And this is a view of, this is Fred Lang over on the left uh, observing and supervising the Canary Island date palms being moved to save them when Cottage City was taken down and Broadway was converted to a commercial zone. So at that time they were preserving, protecting, they were saving Main Beach Park, they were preserving the, the green belt. This was all a pro-environmental orientation. And it is in that setting that we created the very first landscape and scenic highways plan <laughs> Um, planting trees and medians. And that was an effort in South Laguna under the county that um, they hired me and they also worked with the South Laguna Specific Plan Board of Review to create the, the first landscape and scenic highways plan. And that's what resulted in the planted medians. These are the only medians in, on Coast Highway in all of Laguna Beach. And that was because of that pioneering landscape and scenic highways plan. And in addition to that, the street trees were planted as part of that. But since then we've had the influence of the fire and also the influence of the view preservation and restoration efforts that have somewhat diminished what we've been able to achieve as far as trees are concerned. So this is the landscape and scenic highways element that we worked on uh, for the city, Bob and I, and Greg Vale in starting in 2014. And we, we recognize that Laguna Beach is a world treasure. We, we kind of forget that how precious it is in terms of the nation and the globe and that it, we really should be fostering every part of its beauty, including the landscape and the, and the trees. So in this effort, we consulted geologists and we featured that the San Joaquin Hills, the landscape of Laguna Beach that created the cliffs and the coves and the change, dramatic changes in topography this was all the setting that Laguna Beach was, was blessed with that attracted the artists that made our special and unique character possible. If this whole community were flat, we just wouldn't have that wonderful undulating landscape, the views and the variety of lots and houses and, that we have now. Education also practice the cold stage scrub and the sun maritime chaparral. And so the landscape and scenic highways plan was intended to also preserve and foster that. And this is Eric and um, 
it, it illustrates the fact that the reason we're an arts colony is because of our landscape. That's what they came here for. And so it's, it's all a circle of interrelated um, lucky factors that has produced the Laguna Beach and its heritage that we enjoy and appreciate today. Um, Steve Kellenberg contributed his insights into uh, the urban design. He says Laguna Beach defines good urban design when it really hasn't been designed. <laughs> So this is the planning director at that time of the Irvine Company, who is always doing excellent uh, urban design, very consciously done. Our urban design was done more spontaneously, more related to individual decisions made over many, many week, years of time. The, the plan had all these different components in it that we did address. And we divided the, the, the town, Lagoon Canyon and the coast into neighborhoods. And part of what we did is to feature each neighborhood, describe it, describe its history, describe its landscape character, and try to encourage the embellishment of the character of each individual neighborhood that related to its specific unique qualities. So this is North Laguna on the left and Bluebird Canyon on the right and Canyon Acres and South Laguna. So at this time, uh, there was a whole effort by um, Frank Visca, Dave Connell, and others to control trees in relation to view preservation and view restoration. And so that effort had a big influence on many things that the city did after 1990. Before that, in 1975, they adopted the Heritage Tree Ordinance, which preserved trees and allowed anyone to nominate a tree. And they, it could be approved as a heritage tree with four-fifths of the city council. Later on in the late 90s, Wayne Peterson made a change to that. And now the only the owner can nominate their own tree. And subsequent changes caused um, it almost to be a disincentive to have an, a, a heritage tree because a heritage tree hearing now involves the ability of neighbors to object to view impacts from that existing heritage tree and, and require pruning and require management, which the owner would not be obliged to do if they just didn't list it as a heritage tree. So disincentive instead of incentive. So 1975, it was a positive thing. Now it's become not so positive. Um, so we also did work on the scenic highways and and uh, planning the kinds of things that we started in South Laguna. Made recommendations about parks and the heritage trees, urging more effective preservation policies. So uh, the whole issue of vegetation management and defensible space, development of guidelines about those things is also part of the plan. And this issue held up the approval of this plan for five years because the fire department would not agree with anything but exactly what they thought should be done with vegetation. And then also slope stability and, and erosion control. So there's also this, this is the scenic highways plan and it shows how there, we divided it up in zones and made recommendations about each zone. This is a drawing from the plan that talks about the landscape of Laguna Canyon here. You can see the, cha the channel on the right and you see the large trees that we were hoping to get. Those would have been oaks and sycamores. 
And as Bob mentioned, we weren't allowed to have those on the sides. We were hoping that the sides of, of the whole canyon road would have tall arching branches, uh, making a, a beautiful tunnel of love down coast high, down Laguna Canyon Road. But we were not allowed to do that. And so now we have the medium-sized trees in the middle and medium-sized shrubs and trees on the sides. Hopefully we will find some additional places to plant sycamores and oaks like Bob did in the mini park. Sketches on how those, there's a, a different areas should be treated. And then these little green squares along the coast highway, those are all projected areas where we could have planted medians. So they could be similar to what we have in South Laguna. And we're hoping that we'll be able to achieve that now with the Caltrans project that is that is uh, ongoing. They have agreed to put some medians. We have a 12, a 14 foot wide median in South Laguna. Now Caltrans will only allow a six feet wide median. So these are the kinds of constraints we're dealing with. Uh, these are the neighborhoods and these and uh, downtown. We saw that one before. We saw that one before. And um, so each neighborhood has its own specific character. This is the red flowering eucalyptus in South Laguna. Recommendations on the bus shelters. You can see there's some some nice bus shelters in South Laguna, not anywhere else. Um, and then this is recommendations on tree wells, recommendations to preserve this antique bench in front of the, the council chambers, which was ignored and has those benches with the little pegs have somehow disappeared. But anyway, uh, recommendations on street furniture and then how to prune or not prune our trees. And Ruben will be talking more about that. I'm sure Ruben likes that middle one the best. Beautiful. <laughs> so this is the paint. This is one of our recent artists um, doing the wonderful trees on Broadway. And, you know, there was a proposal with the downtown action plan that all these trees would be removed and the trees also on Forest Avenue would be removed and replaced with some so-called better trees. And fortunately that didn't happen. And I hope that we will be able to prevail in preserving our mature trees. Whoops, okay. Come on, it won't let me go to that one. Okay, so this is one of the, there's a whole series of things that have happened since the turn of the century that have created a much more negative uh, milieu for preserving and planting trees. And this uh, fire department's defensible space proposal, uh, which you know, requires trees to be so far away from the house that they'd be off your lot. So that means that nobody can plant trees next to their house. So we showed this example on the right, which is a, a beautiful house, a beautiful yard, and a, a shelter and sheltering trees. And that is exactly what the fire department is trying to prevent. So we had a big um protest about that and the city council did not adopt the fire department's recommendations but i think the fire department is still required to or intervenes in reviewing landscape plans that come through and they're imposing what they want to the restrictions that they want in in this creating these defensible space zones which is not allowing larger trees Design Review Board is not allowing larger trees for the most part. And, and uh, so, in fact, we just had one that came through Design Review and the, the owners were proposing to remove all the existing trees and start fresh. 
like there is no time frame respect in terms of how long it takes for a tree to be meaningful as it grows. In the end, uh, many of us worked together to create this application that was sent to the National Park Service um, to, to request that Laguna Beach and the Greenbelt be designated as a historic American landscape. And that was approved. And this book has been published. It's available. And it, it illustrates and discusses the importance of our, of our landscape in, in what we love about Laguna Beach. And so I'm hoping that a renewed appreciation of this and understanding that trees are an important part of the character of our town, both historically and, and visually. And that we should not be setting up an environment that is so prohibitive of, of uh, major tree planting and, main and maintaining uh, trees in a way that that is so limited to um, not in, impeding in anyone's view. It's impossible for a tree not to impede someone's view somewhere. But I think we have to be also appreciative of the environment that they create in terms of climate, in terms of loveliness in our community. So this, I just want to read, this is Bob's, one of Bob's favorite quotes. It's from Andres Doni, who is an urban planner. And he said, when he was interviewed to work on the downtown specific plan, this is a place of extraordinary character, of delicate and fragile character, built over time by very unusual people. I can't bring anything useful from anywhere else that is, is useful here except what would crush you. I recognize and admire what has been achieved here and I know what destroys this kind of place. The role of a planner is to figure out what can go wrong with a place like this and vaccinate it, prevent it from being lost. This place is very fragile and very, very subject to destruction by the forces of the 21st century. And that's what we're seeing um, happen to us right now. So um, hopefully we'll have a resurgence of that environmental perspective that was prior to uh, the mid nineties. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, that was fabulous. And we have some questions, uh, you know, in the chat, the people are being uh, able to put their questions in chat. So we'll have quite a few, I'm sure, at the end of the presentations. And so the next presenter. I will stop sharing then, right? I, Ruben will be sharing the screen next. So. Hopefully. Okay. Well, then I'll talk about Ruben while he starts to uh, get his photos up and running. So uh Many of you do know Ruben Flores. He is a master landscape designer builder for public and private clients. He owns the Laguna Nursery in North Laguna. He's owner of Visionscape Incorporated, and he's well known for his advocacy in protecting Laguna's trees, open spaces, and the environment. His topic, which Anne mentioned some of that he will speak about are, you know, maybe more from a practical standpoint of how we can deal with trees on our own properties. So Ruben, if you're ready, go right uh, ahead. What, what we need to do here, Anne, uh, go to uh, the upper right-hand corner of Ruben's uh, image, and there's three dot, dot, dots like a menu. And if you click that, you can make him the host. So Ruben, for you to share first, you have to become the host. So, Anne, you need to go to, you're the host, Anne. You need to make Ruben I the host. I did that. No, I did. I know, I did it. Okay, Ruben, you can share. Can you see this? Not yet. 
Mm. No, we can see you, Ruben. But we can't see his exhibits. So now, yeah, so hit uh, share screen in the bottom, bottom and it will bring up your multiple screens. You pick the one that has the images you want to show. Can you see anything yet? Yes, we see it. You, <laughs> what do you see? <laughs> we see we your see. page with AOL ma mail. <laughs> and we see uh, Gail's uh, poster. Okay, now we see, now we see some, a so, log, a log. A, a okay, let's log. here. There we go. Can you see these trees yes. here? Yes. Okay, let's see if we can go here. You should do a full screen option. Yes, thank you. It's down. See the image? There's a, two arrows opposing one another on the Im, top of the image margin there. Up. Next there you to go. the app. There you go. Yeah. OK. So let's just start here. Um, one of the beauties of trees, whether they're in Laguna or in Europe or any Mediterranean climate, is the structure. What you want to do um, when you look at a tree is to look for its structure. Many times the structure of a tree is hidden by either an overabundance of cross branching and or too much foliage, but looking at the strength of a tree comes from its structure. Um, it doesn't really matter what variety of tree it is, every tree has a structure. Notice on the last two that you have a central axis and then the, the secondary branches would come out and they kind of do a fan shape. Um, and when they're crossing is when there's actually visual disharmony. So when they're all kind of coming out from a central location and then fanning out is when you get that harmony. Now, harmony also comes in the grouping of a tree. This is one of my favorite little parks. It's at the end of Diamond and it's got an abundance of trees. They're beautiful, it's full. And a shady summer uh, on a sunny summer afternoon, go in here and, and experience the beauty of the shade from trees. Um, here again is the same area. Um, if you haven't been to this little park, uh, do yourself a favor and take a look at the big trees. Go and relax, read a book, play chess. It's a beautiful area. Um, all of these trees in our parks, uh, many of our trees in our parks are an example of what you can use um, in your smaller uh, particular yards. Um, palms have been turned into enemies in the right location. They're beautiful, they're graceful, they're uh, uh, iconic, especially for California. Um, obviously what's important is that we keep them clean. Look at these trees here. They're at uh, the slope above City Hall. You can see on the one in the foreground that uh, they are burnt because during the fires, these got uh, hit. They are up at Mystic Hills um, on Hill Edge. Uh, they didn't burn um, or the foliage didn't burn because they were well-maintained and uh, the trunks burnt, but there was no uh, burning of the fan of the trees themselves. Find your tree, go to a nursery, see when it's in bloom. Um, uh, this is a tababuya tree, beautiful pink flowers, uh, tababuya ippi or avalande, depending on um, who's calling it. And uh, it smells like chocolate. It's uh, a really, really beautiful, graceful tree. Uh, the city of Fontana has used them all over their city. So in other words, they grow in a, in a 80 degree, uh, I mean, 80 mile per hour winds. 
a uh, hundred degree heat, uh, lack of care, and they look incredible. The beautiful walks that we have in our town are really something to enjoy. We live in a town that's so graceful and so incredible. Um, please do everything that you can to go out and walk and, and be amongst the trees. I do believe that a landscape isn't something that you walk next to, but really it's something that you walk alongside or underneath. And you can only do that by having some larger trees. Um, then you get to your landscape situation. You want some trees, but you've got to make sure that you're allowing all the views from the windows and allowing uh, for your elements of your landscape. What can you do? Italian cypress is a very good Italian uh, Mediterranean tree. Try and see how you can make use of those in your property. This is a great tree. Um, it's a, uh, a tree that used to be all over our town. Um, there's an incredible one, this one here. Um, and this was before the bump out of the curb. And it needs attention by our city. And they're failing to, to give it that attention. It's a carob tree. And just, just a, a magnificent trunk whenever it can get to that age. Here's a great example of a ficus tree. This ficus tree is in front of Villa Rockledge. And um, it's probably 80 years old plus. Uh, beautiful open, it's open beautifully every year. So a tree doesn't have to be a view, view blocker. When I was the chair of the view restoration committee, um, I believe that we looked at 10 cases at the most and really everything could be solved, almost everything could be solved by just opening up the, the canopy of a tree. Here's a great, great, great graceful tree in Heisler Park. It's a Melaleuca nesophila or a pink Melaleuca. Uh, they're all over our town, but very few are allowed to sprawl and get as large as this. This is a historic tree. I don't know if it's been deemed historic, but the way it gracefully maneuvers over the uh, the lawn is just incredible. We planted some natal plum around the base of it to stop people from uh, climbing inside. And unfortunately the city has allowed that natal plum to almost grow as tall as a tree. So um, hopefully the city will get back on this. Here's a beautiful red uh, blue gum that uh, is in Three Arch Bay. It's in a lawn. Unfortunately, the two of these uh, blue gums have fallen and uh, are gone now. But it's so great to see these. When they were planted, these were probably 100 years old. Um, they were just so graceful. We've got to find a couple places in our town, a couple 10 places in our town where we can plant one or two again so that we can see these uh, examples of history um, that graced our town so, so fully all over town. Again, how can you landscape a building when you only have three or four feet, maybe eight feet? These Washingtonia Robustas are a great example of, a, of uh, adorning a beautiful building. Um, so there are ways to do it. Remember, there's the right tree for every situation. I loved um, Anne's uh, thought of environmental perspective versus institutional perspective. Um, putting the right tree in because it is the right tree. Here's a tree that many of you have probably seen it's a Podocarpus gracilior. Many people plant it around their houses as a, a cute little hedge to divide their yard from the next person's yard. And they plant them 18 inches on center. If you see this tree, um, it's behind the school. It's probably 80 feet tall and 80 feet wide. You need to know that the roots on this tree are probably 80 feet tall and 80 feet wide. So the roots grow to uh, accommodate the canopy. Remember that when you put ficus trees right next to each other because you really do love your privacy from your neighbor, that the, the heads want to get this large. Here's a nasty pruning job, and you understand that the pruning is done for views. Um, let's use the right tree for the right situation. Um, here again, we always think about trim, trimming down the tree so that it stays out of the view. What is the possibility for growing a tree so that it grows 
out of your view. Um, that is always a possibility. Um, try and create a canopy that goes over your stairways rather than something that is to the right or the left of your stairway. And what if you allowed the branches to really cascade over a staircase and give you that unbelievable view up as you're walking down some stairs uh, with some beautiful branches above you? We all want a screen to block out the neighbors. So think about what that screen might be. Putting in um, pine trees that grow 80 feet tall and 80 feet wide, um, when they're young, they look great because they uh, quickly grow into their space. But what happens is they grow out of their space just as quickly. The right tree for the right situation is key. Um, try and use both small growing trees. The one on the right here is a pomegranate, a beautiful, incredible landscape tree. It has the flowers that are orange, the fruit that it's an orange red. Um, it's deciduous, so it allows as much sun in as possible. To the left is an olive tree. All this is a Mediterranean uh, type landscape. Use some drought tolerant ground cover underneath and it makes for an unbelievable drought tolerant look. Here's a tree that used to be um, iconic and now it is dead. And this is a Monterey, uh, Monterey pine. Monterey pines were planted all over Orange County back in the day. I don't know if there's too many left. This is was out in front of Solani uh, Steakhouse. And it was unfortunately dedicated to the father of the beautification um, council. Um, and um, now at this point, it was starting, you can see that red growth right in the center. Um, it started to uh, decline. I told both the owners um, of this and unfortunately they didn't heed the warning and now it's dead, but the trunk is still there. Uh, the base of your tree is an important, important part of a tree. Uh, this is where these buttressing roots help to support an incredible tree. Uh, do what you can to allow the roots to grow. I think what happens is we think that this is ugly, this is not right, um, and we either chop them off or cover them up, but really they're a beautiful part of the overall majesty of a tree uh, and there's the top part of that same tree um let's go to the oops we see we both saw in bob and ann's uh talks about some beautiful trees um we don't have an opportunity that often here in Laguna to do something like this, but what can you do? I did an alley of kumquat trees, dwarf kumquat trees. So they only grow to eight feet tall. What's the possibility of putting 16 kumquat trees on either side of a walkway um, and let them be your alley? These are some huge ficus trees on a on a driveway that goes from uh, Coast Highway in South Laguna down to the to the house at the old Brief residence, really making for a beautiful walk going down. And here's a Melaleuca and some uh, Washingtonias going over a walkway as you go down in a house on um, uh, Emerald Bay. And here is the banyan trees of Hawaii. And these are roots that you see coming down. These aren't trunks. And we have our banyan tree at Main Beach. How incredible would it be if we were to allow it to get as broad as it could be rather than trimming it back on the sides and really allowing it to be the tree uh, that it could be. Trees, all of us rejoice when we see an unbelievable old tree. We, we just start to fantasize about how did it get there and 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 what did it take and um, how many birds have have graced that tree and what can we do to to support it in the future having large trees these trees are in San Juan Capistrano um, really do make a city 
more beautiful. And when you see big trees and cars together, the cars don't make that much of an impact because the trees are making such a huge impact. Just go to the montage and look at that row of eucalyptus next to the, to the cars. And you hardly notice the cars because of the beauty of the trees. And we do have our oceans and we do have our views. What can we do? Put trees that are slender. Remember, all of your views can be framed by trees. And how can you make that happen? Um, and, and what trees can you plant that will grow out of the view so that you can see underneath? And what can you do to highlight your house and yet have a large tree? The tree doesn't have to be centered in the front yard. It can be centered on the side. It can be planted on the side so that you have a different view. And we might think of eucalyptus as a as not the best tree, but you must realize that our environment is pretty harsh. Um, we get salt winds, we get hot weather, and we have a drought. Although they may not be the absolute ideal tree, they are an ideal tree in Laguna Beach just because they grow here. Um, I think every new arborist that comes to Laguna Beach um, <clears throat> wonders why there's so many, and then they plant other trees, and then they realize why the eucalyptus are here. It's just because they can withstand the, the uh, environmental issues at hand. This may not be a tree in Laguna, but the trees are so f phenomenal. And here's a, an, a great example of a tree that we see when we come down park. And every time we have the, um, the parade and you're on that street and you see that tree and you realize that you can open up a tree to allow for the view. Um, not all Araucaria trees or No Fork Island pines grow this open, but they can be trimmed to be this open so that you're not feeling like it's blocking your view. Here's a tree. Oops, let's back that up. up. Uh, Ruben, just to let you know, you asked me to let you know when it was 14 minutes. Okay, let's go to another one. Here's a tree that if you haven't seen it, you should go see it. This is a, a tree that's behind Elcat. And it is truly the one of the most beautiful trees in our whole town. It is It makes you ask yourself, what is a tree? Because for most of us, a tree is something that's planted in front of a house and it has a single trunk and it grows 80 feet tall and it's um, shading the roof. But when you go see this tree, you rethink what is a tree and can it grow horizontally? And, and what is the beauty of a tree? Do yourself a favor and go take a look at this tree. Um, speaking of the environmental perspectives, the tree fell and it regrew. And it's just an unbelievable uh, example of how life continues even after something crazy. So um, I, I can't explain enough how important it is for us to uh, cherish the environment that we have here that can support uh, horticultural life to such an extent. Um, and what we can do to support that as well, and that is to plant some trees. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. That was a lovely presentation and uh, educational, which is helpful. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions for you. So our last speaker, but not least, is Barbara McGillivray. Many of you know her and her husband were their film company, McGillivray Freeman Films but they are also extremely generous supporters of the world's oceans in numerous ways, but she's also very hardworking and involved with the city advocacy of the trees in town. So Barbara's topics will cover a little more probably about city involvement with trees and the history of the Laguna Beach being a tree city community. So Barbara, we appreciate you being here and 
I don't think you have uh, a screen to share, so we'll just let you talk. Uh, Ruben, uh, uh, un un unshare. Okay. Let me get to that screen. And you can make me host if you want to. Sorry, I just realized that I had to unmute. <laughs> There's still you still want that photo up? We're just gonna we're gonna have Ruben unshare that's, and Dean become host. That, that's fine. I can go ahead and start. And um I I have to say we just heard from uh three arboreal poets. And uh there we have we've heard from uh two uh very Laguna tree loving uh landscape architects and one master landscape designer builder. And all three have devoted much of their professional lives to protecting and enhancing our precious urban forest, which protects our artistic town. And you can just feel, that's why I love listening to them. You can feel their love and passion uh, for what they do and for what they've contributed to the town. We live in a very special community, which loves both trees as well as their ocean views. Everyone is all too aware of the increasing heat every summer which brings ever increasing pleasure in walking down our tree shaded streets. My husband, Greg, and I are two among many who feel this arboreal ardor. But I have to confess that it was only about 10 years ago that we became fully aware of the depth of our passion. Before then we were just taking trees for granted as part of the loveliness of our town. Then one day in April of 2013, we had the abrupt awakening of what we could lose. It's a painful memory that became seared in our brains. We were just walking onto Ocean Avenue from Coast Highway when we saw that men equipped with giant cutting machinery were in the middle of demolishing the two beautiful mature ficus trees in front of the Marine Room. Word got to us that the trees were being removed because the owner of the Marine Room did not like the tiny red berries from the trees on the sidewalk. We thought, found that Pretty strange since cigarette butts had never appeared to be a problem. <laughs> Lots of those beautiful shade providing trees mobilized us and brought many other speakers, namely one Pamela Goldstein, uh, who was able to sum up the tragic loss best by calling it the Chainsaw Massacre. And I know, um, as just was mentioned, several other, uh, I think a total of five ficus trees were taken down. The loss of the two heritage lumberyard trees were next in 2016. Then, but for the efforts of Ruben, Kelly Boyd, and Tony Eisman, the pepper tree in front of City Hall, also a heritage tree planted at the same time in 1879. You had, someone had said um, it was in um, 1881, but anyway, as the, um, it was planted at the same time as the two downed heritage lumberyard trees, um, were cut down and it's so wonderful to see that that proud tree minus its leaning top is still there today in front of city hall a bit later in january 2017 tony declared there was a war on trees but but back to 2013 when greg and i were thinking about ways to bring more tree loving people together and started developing the concept of some kind of fun that could be available to help the city with planting more trees at one point in 2017, we went to Ruben, who at that time was head of the Laguna Beach Beautification Council to see if there was a way to work there with such a fund. But we finally determined it would be most feasible with making transfers to the city to establish this fund at the Orange County Community Foundation. We ultimately deposited 50,000 there in February of 2018, hoping that others might ultimately join in. <laughs> Ruben, I have to give you credit because you did. <laughs> <laughs> Three weeks later, on February 17th, another major goal was accomplished when the City Council agreed to recognize Arbor Week, since Charade Dupuy, then head of public works, had been most enthusiastic and receptive to that concept. The first Arbor Day was held just over a year later at Jaros Park site on March 7th, 2019, with terrific attendance. The sixth Arbor Day will be coming this March, and our arborist Matthew Barker will be alerting us soon as to where it will be located. We currently have a special Tree City ranking, which Matthew has made possible, 
We recently received the Growth Award from the Arbor Day Foundation in honor of our higher levels of tree care and community engagement. Now back to history. In March of 2017, I had made an outreach to Santa Barbara regarding their tree city designation, which I learned they originally received in 1980. And it was that call that led to our having Arbor Day here. In doing that, I also discussed their urban forest department within the Santa Barbara City Council. That seemed like such a brilliant concept. And then several months later, in May of 2017, I learned about Adam Schwerner, who had just joined the Arts Commission and become chair. His background of taking care of large urban forests in Chicago and California was fantastic to learn about. And when we were able to meet and discuss issues in Laguna. Uh, Adam was and is such a force multiplier, a human dynamo of creative energy. In June of 2017, we had the first Laguna Tree Foundation meeting with interested participants, including those here. This became a regular event leading to regular Laguna Tree Foundation meetings discussing, among other things, how a Laguna Beach Urban Forestry Council, um, excuse me, could be set up. Finally, in December of 2018, after transferring 30,000 out of the Orange County Community Foundation Laguna Urban Tree Foundation to the city, we were able to celebrate the planting of 30 trees on Ocean Avenue. That was cause for such great celebrating. January and February of 2019 focused a lot on determining the best tree wells with tons of work done by the other participants here. May of 2019 provided an important tree event at City Hall, which Adam made possible through his contact with Matt Wells, city manager for Santa Monica. I know many of you were there that are just on, are on this Zoom right now. Matt oversaw the award-winning job of planting and maintaining his city's wonderful urban forest. That event was highly attended by our town's tree lovers, and we were able to collect many signatures from those in town concerned about our trees with hope of establishing regular communication with them. A month later, Sheree organized a meeting at the Suzy Q with about 20 or more well-versed tree specialists, including all of our dedicated tree, tree uh, uh, specialists here. And um, it was uh, to, to look at the, the best spe tree species to use in the downtown area. Meanwhile, June through November of 2019, Adam helped us lead a push to finally establish an arborist position in town, which resulted in the hiring of our first arborist, Nate Ferris, on November 7th, 2019. What was most exciting about it, that initial hiring was the possibility of having a meet and greet with Nate, giving a presentation at City Hall of his background and goals as the first city arborist to a very enthusiastic audience. In order to streamline clear messages to City Hall, we were able to implement regular monthly meetings with Nate, led by Adam, and including Ruben, Bob, Ann, and Chris Reed. Those meetings were both cordial and productive since differences in opinions about tree species and where to plant them could all be ironed out in the hour long regular sessions. Unfortunately, our first arborist resigned after seven months to follow other interests. After a seven month search by Public Works in April of 2021, Matthew Barker was hired away from his role as arborist for Alex Alexandria, Virginia in Washington, DC and became our second arborist. Since COVID was in full swing, we couldn't do the same meet and greet, greet city hall reception that we had given Nate. And Matthew even had to do his first Arbor Day planting on Zoom. So that's my history, <laughs> leaned out of a uh, two foot high stack <laughs> of uh, very chaotic files that I've saved over the past 10 years. But I'm not done quite yet. <laughs> Because for the future, please don't be done. <laughs> okay, I would love to propose that we have that long overdue city hall meeting to appropriately introduce Matthew Barker and give him the same opportunity that Nate had to address his goals, concerns, and suggestions for expediting tree planting. We could also learn just what he has been able to accomplish with his original desire to create a tree canopy analysis. He recently received a positive answer from his grant request for $100,000 through the Inflation Reduction Act to upgrade the city's digital resources. 
Hopefully this data can be collated into the urban forestry master plan in order to plant over a hundred more new trees. Being able to do, to do this would fulfill one of his goals originally proposed in his successful interviews for the city arborist position. That goal was to transfer the city away from what he calls a reactive maintenance program to a data-driven progressive management system. Now, I'm just a tree dilettante and I'm trying to learn more um, from the many talks that I've enjoyed with Matthew. And this is clearly not the language that our beloved um, tree specialist, arborist, um, and Laguna landscapers talk with. But he has explained to me that he looks at trees as individual entities in an infrastructure network rather than as landscape design elements. To have those tree perspective plans elaborated by our arborist in a town hall meeting would be so interesting, as well as to listen to potential follow-up discussion with our landscape professionals and others. Of further interest for such a meeting, it would be super helpful to understand directly from Matthew his attempt to follow Elshard or the Landscape and Scenic Highways Resource Document revised in 2018 from the original 1995 document. I think we were using different dates too by a year. And of course, Bob and Ann worked on both of those along with a number of others. This lists the different species of native and non-native plants recommended for all areas in the downtown. Again, in our talks, he has explained to me that he tries to follow this document whenever possible, even when it is against his own best judgment. He is peppered by requests from many different people in town and finds that the vast majority of species asked for are non-native requests. And frequently there are requests for the same species to all be planted on one block. He feels it of tremendous importance to maintain native plants as much as possible, as well as biodiversity. He loves the saying that high biodiversity means high resilience, but I'm not a good interpreter for him. <laughs> and again, I want to emphasize how enlightening it would be, how enlightening it would be to hear him present at City Hall as when we learn so much from the presentation of Matt Wells, as well as Nate Ferris. Finally, as one last point, it would be great to renew the subcommittee meetings with Matthew that were so productively done with Nate. Uh, so thank you for your patience in listening to me. And I know that Matthew uses a whole different language than the arboreal poetry used by the three of you, Ruben, where are you, Bob and Anne. But um, I hope you can really um, give him a chance and take to heart uh, his very earnest desires to have the best uh, arboreal canopy, urban tree forest in Laguna. So thank you. Thank you, Barbara. That thank was wonderful. You. While I have you, do you have a date in March for Arbor Day yet? You you said March. Oh, I said I said he will be giving it soon. Oh, they have to find a date. A, a date has not been set in March yet. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. Well, I did see a thumbs up from Ruben, and you know, perhaps the future, you know, uh, you know, re resurrecting your committee, I think, you know, certainly could be explored and probably is possible. So, all right. Well, I appreciate your all of your comments. Everyone has been wonderful. We have some questions in chat, so if I could maybe start with some of those and, um. Let's see, we'll start with the earlier ones. Does, would any of you happen to know what year the pepper tree on Ocean Avenue was planted? We have a question, I guess historic trees are hmm. important. A long time ago. <laughs> that work? I think there's a plaque there because it had to do with the uh, original uh, playhouse or something, didn't it? Yeah, I, I, it, it's, it's probably a similar time to the, you know, late eighteen hundreds or early nineteen hundreds, when Rogers planted all those trees. Well, it could have been planted when they built the play, the first playhouse too. We don't know. 
but maybe someone yeah. else knows. It's it's a good old one though. So one of the questions also was, what can we do to save all of the old trees in Laguna Beach? That being one of them. Well, just not chop them down. <laughs> you know, when when they wanted to chop down the one at uh, City Hall, um, and it was almost done. They really thought that that was the best answer for City Hall. And so what we need to make sure of is that every option is exhausted before we go to the complete opposite of what this goal is, and that is to have a canopy. Um, we, we need to give that respect to the trees. Also, the, the tree on the roundabout, for example, you know, they repaired the sidewalk by supposedly cutting into the roots of the tree. And perhaps we should we should be designing our pavement in consideration of the tree to begin with, instead of looking at the tree as being in the way of a sidewalk, which can easily be replaced. And a tree 40 or 50 years old takes another 40 or 50 years to get big again. And and you asked about um, if Matthew said anything else about that. And I asked him about that because I met with him this morning. Mm -hmm. And um, he he said that they're in the process of of finding dates in order to do it and finding and setting up. It's a it's a it takes a bit. And this guy has been occupied who does the does the laser, you know, that, uh -huh. which, which is yes. what he planned to do. So he's working on that. Great. One of the trees that I showed I in the uh... asked him who is the arborist that they're using. And what tests are they doing? And he hasn't replied. It would be interesting to know oh, the answers to yeah, those questions. They're, they're still, if people are busy and it, it's it, he's trying yeah. to let it go up as fast as he can make it go. One of the trees that I showed in my presentation was the tree on um, <clears throat> Legion, that is an old carob tree. Um, and one of the things that we need to do is is to even support homeowners. Um, and that is to uh, support them in maintaining a tree that is a beautiful old historic tree. The city was great enough to bump out the curb so that the tree had its ability to grow. Um, but right now the city doesn't want to trim the tree. And what's probably going to happen is it's going to fall over from it's just too heavy and it's leaning. So we should all make a concerted effort to support whatever we can do to make sure that these trees continue. Mm -hmm. So is that a question for the public has... works or for the arborist, the city arborist or the public works department? Who, who, who would we think has the responsibility to maintain that? Yes. What, what yes. I would love to do is, is, is Barbara, when you, you get our next tree seminar together, or as we put it together, all of us, um, is that we form a committee that, maybe the city endorses or at least gives a nod to um, because I think what's happening is the city doesn't want to take the responsibility of giving uh, suggestions to a homeowner in case they're going to then sue the city. Um, just my suppositions. Um, but, you know, I think between Bob and Barbara and I, we could all come up with suggestions of how a tree can be supported to uh, live a longer life. All right. Well, we have a question from a, a homeowner along those lines that uh, Debbie is asking, when we bought our house, there was an existing podocarpus that is now impacting the foundation of our house. We would like to replace it with another large tree, but we are concerned that the city won't let us. What can we do? How do we get permission to replace it with another large tree if it's on their property? Uh and it's not an heritage tree. They don't need the city's permission, but it seems like they think they do. So would someone like to respond to that question? If the tree is on an approved landscape plan, then they do need the city's uh, permission. Uh, or if, if it's, it's that, if, there it, is. if it's that, old, it's not going to be on a plan, right? Excuse me? If it's a, if it, the tree is that old, it's not going to be on a plan. Well, it depends. If someone else, if someone 
proposed a landscape okay. plan for the property when they did a remodel and they showed it as an existing tree to remain, then they do need a permit. Could be. Sure, could be. Remove it. More um, more likely than not, though, it's just a tree that's an old tree and they don't have to uh, get a special permit from the city to plant a new tree. They just need to plant one that's going to have roots that don't damage the foundation and keep it maintained properly. Yeah, the, the first question is, do they have an approved landscape plan? Because right. there's two different answers to that question, depending on if they do or don't have. Right. So they should go to the city, uh, go, to the, go to the planning department or the building department and have them check their file and see. And look what... in the file yourself on the online. True. She's saying on the chat, no landscape plan. Okay. Okay. So. It, yeah, so that's a private decision. Right. In that hey, case. So you need some good advice from a landscape architect or a, <laughs> a person like Ruben. And no, since we haven't seen it, we're not supposed to be giving medical <laughs> we're advice. We're not giving, right. <laughs> so. taking, the, taking the blood pressure and the temperature and all those. <laughs> exactly. All right, but um, I'm not quite sure there's a tree near Active Culture, which is off Glen Airy. And so does anyone know which tree that is? It's a coral tree right between uh, Active Culture and the woman's dress shop okay. or just a dress shop. Coral, okay. It's a large coral tree and it's being pruned incorrectly. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a question from Dee Perry. She is one of our school board members and she is wondering if it's possible to have one of the wonderful experts take a look at the school campuses and analyze if there are more places for trees, to install more trees. Absolutely, yes. So we would have to maybe have a discussion with Dee after the meeting about how to do that. Okay. Absolutely. I'll get in touch with you, Dee. Okay. Should pomegranate trees be trimmed? Uh, sure. <laughs> Is, are pomegranate trees? If, are they're, pomegranate if they're too big, yes. <laughs> and, and, and they can be laced out. There's one incredible, unbelievable historic pomegranate tree in somebody's backyard. And we were on a garden walk and they allowed us to go in the back. And there it was. It was beyond words. So incredible. Um, and so there really are some cherished trees in town, but yeah, they can be opened up, laced out, and then they will fruit a little bit more, flower a little bit more, and look even greater. I, I saw a chat about what happened to on the Podocarpus tree, what happens if the neighbors complain that the tree's coming out. And uh, I mean, I've had two big trees removed on both sides of my house in the last five years. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate. I wasn't uh, happy about it, but there, to my knowledge, there's no law that on a private property, if there's no overriding protection for the tree, a person can take it out and plant a new one if they, if they want to. Unfor but I mean, in some ways, if, I can say that's unfortunate. They're old, they're mature trees if possible. Yes, correct. Okay, there's some comments in chat also about other trees around town. Uh, for example, about uh, old growth trees in front of the marine room. And they feel perhaps that restaurant owners should be informed of the value of having tree-friendly tree-lined streets in regards to enhancing value of their respective businesses. That's sort of a comment that probably is true and that could be something pursued. Well, that was that was the, the, the trees that, uh, that Barbara was mentioning, those trees have been removed, they're gone. So- Unfortunately. All of them? By the Marine Room. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're right gone. Mm -hmm. And that was Kelly Boyd was on the council and and he he loved the fact they were coming out. <laughs> he was still the owner of the marine room at the time, right? <laughs> yep. Okay. I I one of the things that Adam said about that we published in the um landscape scenic 
Berkeley's research document was that it's really well known that commercial districts that are successful all over the world have big trees. I mean, that's pre pretty much of a, a universal uh, um, idea. And so I, I think when you take out those trees, like, like happened on Ocean Avenue, fortunately, uh, they weren't all taken out. There was a few taken out, but it did diminish the the business uh, environment and the pedestrian environment in a way that uh, has it's never been the same since. It shortened the vista of that street. Mm -hmm. It'll take a long time for those Tristanias to to do what those ficus were already doing. Right. Right. Well, Bob discussed. The Laguna Canyon Road trees somewhat. The and Carrie Strombotny is asking about the sycamore trees um, that have been butchered. And is there a way for Caltrans to work with our arborists to trim correctly? Well, I I mean I believe that our arborist and maybe Barbara knows more is in touch with Caltrans. How much influence he has probably is a good question, but. Well, the, the sycamore, if she's talking about the sycamores at the park, the, at the mini park, there were four originally that I designed when the park was built about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. The county allowed three of them to stay. And the, the construction people, when they were digging for the channel, some of the, some of the construction equipment hit the hit the branches of the trees. And uh, I talked to Matthew about that and, and he was aware of that as well. It was really something that I, I don't think it was a um, uh, an effort on Caltrans or the county's part to butcher the trees. I think it just, some of the branches broke off as a result of the, uh, you know, the efforts of the cranes that were working out there at the time. The when trees saw, are actually when, still in pretty in good shape. When when I saw uh, Carrie's uh, comment at butchered, uh, what came to mind are the uh, tree trimming in front of uh, on Laguna Canyon Road in front of uh, Laguna Canyon Artist Studios. There's uh, four <laughs> yes, or five yeah. trees there, and uh, my wife and I drove by it today, and we said last year we said it was a hack job. They must have heard us and said, well, if you think that was a hack job, look what we did this year. It is quite something. That That's private property, though, I think. Right. I, don't, I don't think that's Caltrans. No, no I'm, sure, I'm sure it's not and it, Caltrans. And it's an artist colony area. That's even <laughs> right. the more right. reason that, and, and those trees have been chopped to beyond belief. So it's just really sad. Right. And I just mentioned, and this is something that Chris Reed has mentioned many times, that other other cities have severe pruning ordinances. So there are prohibitions against certain kinds of pruning that it, that are in a city adopted ordinance, even on private property. And so that sort of thing would help to keep that type of pruning from being done. Wait, do we have that ordinance? No, no. we don't. No, oh, we don't. Other cities do. Other cities. So. San Juan Capistrano, for example, has Santa that. Barbara, Hope Ranch does as well. So, well, yes. That's something we could strive for. Yes. That would be a great recommendation to have for the city since we are so caring about our trees and our landscapes. Um, that artist painting you put up on along Broadway and was a beautiful one that showed the B of A building. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you happen to know who that artist was? It's a is it Jacobucci? Ma Ma Mark Jacobucci. Oh, lovely, very lovely. Yeah, he ha he happens to be a landscape architect by coincidence, but uh, oh well, he's an excellent painter too. <laughs> he he is. A ex yeah, he he's a festival exhibitor every year. Right. Well, we're all artists, Bob and Ruben. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, sometimes art can be abstract, like the trees in front of the artist studio. <laughs> so, so. Um, the last question I see in chat is two trees fell on a slope near the, I believe, the breaching whale on Cliff Drive. And I and this person, Patricia Truman, has asked 
many times for trees to be planted to create shade in the summer as the prior trees did. The ones that fell were shallow roots. We need deep root trees that would give shade. The two trees on the slope near the whale on cliff, do mm -hmm. you know what one that is? Um, one was a Monterey Cypress mm -hmm. um, and two new ones are coming up, but they aren't necessarily planted by the city. So um, it's beautiful that the landscape on its own is trying to renew itself, which just makes me so happy that if we don't do it, somehow it, it might still happen. Um, but it is it is a rough slope. And so uh, it, it, it would behoove us. Um, if you look along the coast, all along uh, the edge of the coast, the uh, Lagunaria trees are sprouting. Um, and I know Anne saw this. Um, they came up in Fisherman's uh, Cove um, all by themselves as well. And so <clears throat> not only is the ocean and the environment giving us clues, but it doesn't work if we don't heed those clues. So what the environment is trying to tell us that those trees are good for us. And uh, it would behoove the city to take a look at that and start to use those trees in the landscapes. Yeah, we reckon they took the, the, the struggling trees that were growing outside the Hotel Laguna. I think four of those were removed. And Ruben and I suggested the Lagoon area for that, for those spots. But uh, I don't think Matthew agrees with that recommendation. And most likely what, what is going to be planted there will not do well. It's, it's a very tough spot, especially the part next to the parking lot where the winds just whip right across there. Yeah, so the Lagoon area has proved itself to survive. It's it's the tree next to the south end of Main Beach restroom. That that would be a good discussion with Barbara and in the group with Matthew yeah. to maybe see yeah. what, if we can come up with a mutually. Um, yes, good idea. Those are, that's a very important. Those are very important locations. Yes. Barbara, if you want to talk, you're muted. Okay. No, I just I just realized that. <laughs> and I was trying to we we talked we talked about that because there are four trees that um are on the you know the the L shard for that area. And I know you the one that you picked was not on that list. Right. And he had, I can't remember now. Because I'm so bad with species, but the one um, I think Metrosideros is what he's proposing to plant. Okay. Well, that yeah, that was that was his proposal. And so it, you know, it is adapted to ocean conditions, but probably not that that severe. Hmm. Well, that's that's his. Um, that was that was his. Uh Aren't there Metro Sideros in uh, Main Beach Park that are pretty uh, tattered, pretty windblown? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you want a character effect, that's what the ones in Main Beach are. They're they're kind of like the Mel the Melaleucas that Ruben was showing in a little different way. But if you want a street tree, that's uh, going to be difficult. They're going to look the like trees that he tore out. And the truth is our environment's changing. Um, and some of these trees that may have survived and flourished 20, 30 years ago, don't anymore. It's become that much more severe. So um, Melaleucas and some um, other trees, we used to have an elm in, over by uh, Las Brisas restaurant and it's gone too. And they don't survive with the ocean anymore. And so we've got to go for the ones that are actually that much more hardy. Uh, there's a, a question about, uh, I live on Canyon Acres and the trees along Laguna Canyon at our corners have not been maintained. We call and they say they can't touch it and Caltrans doesn't care, respond. I imagine this person calls 
the city's public works. Uh, Bob, might that be something you know a little about? Well, I, I think that finger of land at corner of Canyon Acres that leads up to the Lumberyard parking lot is, I believe, owned by Caltrans. But I, I don't think it's city uh, jurisdiction. Uh, um, so I don't know, to be honest. It's um, there's Are they talking about the, the Aleppo Pines? I don't know what the they're talking about. Corners of Canyon Acres and Laguna Canyon Road. I yeah, so well, there are some Aleppo pines on the upstream side of Canyon Acres, I think. Yeah, and there used to be more, but they're yeah. dying one by one by mites um, and other <clears throat> Now, the city- I should talk, since that's me. Yes. Um, yes, and and then the little area between Woodland and Canyon Acres is never um, upkept, and the few pines that are left, slowly we've been losing them to the beetle. What's left now, They're they've got it and one tree fell and it's still half in the flood control. I'm constantly calling the city, say, hey, it's looking like the ghetto here, you know, come and weed eat or... Anyway, I have met with the new arborist and he did put in a replacement oak from the last pine they took out. But we're um, like closer to Ganal that used to be the art affair. They put in, there's some banyan trees in there. Um, we've been maintaining that corner and it's a bus stop. But, you know, my husband tries to trim and there's so much debris and we've tried to get the city to haul it off. It's just frustrating because Caltrans won't do anything. The city doesn't want to do anything. And it's just now with all this new planting, it's just really looking sad. I called today, got no response um, to call me back to, would you please weed eat? We've got a homeless person, a couple living just at the signal up in the, um, the, um, National Park there, or the, um, anyway, it's a green tent. They've been living there for at least a month. I was waiting till after the holidays to call them in. But it's so cold at night. You know, who's to say they're not going to start a fire? And um, there was one other thing I was calling them about. Oh, they took our sign down at the corner that said, you know, permit parking only. We have such a problem with the open space park and, you know, the all the hikers coming up. And it's just a disaster. So anyway. I have to say that Marsha Class, who just spoke, and her husband Carl, volunteered to plant that entire finger of of land, all all those succulents and plants that um, you see. And that used to be a vacant lot until they started planting things one by one, and now they take care of it as well as add add to it. So that's that's the kind of uh, residents we we need in town that take the bull by the horns. Is that Caltrans property, though? I I think it is. Yeah, I think it, it's like a remnant piece. They say uh, it's flood control, so everyone just passes it on. Just yeah, yeah, on that, that's in. right. I th Nobody that's wants I... to take any, um, you know, efforts to Fl flood that. control has an easement over ten ten feet from the channel, and that exceeds the ten feet. But there, there's some sort of property line uh, dispute. I'm not really sure what the what the exact uh, answer is, but but at least they're doing a good job. Uh, Marsha and Carl are doing a good job taking care of it. But we're getting old. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point the point is that you know when you look at the city budget and the monies that are being spent, say for consultant uh, studies. On the on the uh, agenda tomorrow night, you'll see two items where they're spending big bucks on consultants, like eight hundred thousand dollars on to study various things. We should be allocating substantial amounts for landscape maintenance, so that you know the areas that are newly planted are maintained properly, the weeds are kept down. That things are are looking like we really care, and I don't see that our public works is really doing a stellar job of many areas in town. Always room for improvement, and and we are adding more areas for them to take care of. So I I totally agree that we need to relook at these budgets because 
you look at other other communities and you don't see weeds everywhere in in parkways like like you do around here and i and i think maybe we're just uh underfunded and and uh under budgeted for that work well i'm encouraged that the four speakers tonight are are willing to work together and you know bring back the committee that they had with the prior city arborist to work with the current one. And if people wanted to become also members of this committee, for example, even if it's for a short term, like, like say D Perry wanting to do something with the school district, you know, property and planting trees, um, would the committee be open to, you know, welcoming people to come to their meetings and, you know, ask about, you know, things they want to see accomplished. So I think this could be something that, you know, could grow out of tonight's program that could be something very beneficial for in a lot of ways. So I appreciate everybody, the speakers, your willingness. Um, if you want to make any final comments about that, um, other than that, I want to make uh, a few more, you know, wrap up a few things like, the book that Anne discussed, which was about the Laguna Beach and the Green Belt, you know, this was a uh, is a great book that is still available. You can get it through uh, iUniverse. It's Ron Chilko was one of the uh, co-authors and contributors of pictures. So this book is around, and I think it's a wonderful uh, book for you if you're interested more in Laguna's historic landscaping uh, situation. So I want to thank Anne for bringing that book up. Yes, Anne? Oh, I'd also like in people to encourage people to get on the city's website and look for landscape and scenic highways element and landscape and scenic highways resource document. Those two are the reports that we worked on for five years mm -hmm. about all the mm -hmm. issues that we've talked about tonight. And I think even if you just go to it and look up your own neighborhood, you'll find things of value in those in those reports. And Thank you. One other thing about that, <clears throat> the house book, I think you should mention Tom Lamb. He put in a huge amount of uh, work and personal time doing the photography for that. Mm -hmm. And designing the book, help design and designing the book. the book, right? Right. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, I, just, I just wanted to give a big thanks to Bob and Anne. I mean, all the work, the years of work that you have put in out of your own personal, I mean, it's your professional time that you've put in and you've devoted so uh, unflinchingly to the care for the trees in Laguna. Yeah. It's really something. Thank you. Thank you. It is wonderful. And Laguna owes a big debt to you, all of you, actually, for what you've been Ruben, doing. Don't leave years. Ruben out. I know. I know. I can always count on Ruben <laughs> for environmental issues. So, okay. So without, uh, you know, wanting to drag this out any further, I just want to remind everybody tomorrow is a very important city council meeting. It, you know, has a number of issues that are important to all of us. And, you know, whether it's the, you know, fuel modification protocols, the uh, Laguna Canyon Road, the undergrounding projects, all of these things are really critical issues that are coming up now. So try and tune in or attend, make your thoughts known, contribute. And we thank you all very, very much for participating this evening. Remember, uh, that we will be posting this program online on the Laguna Canyon Conservancy website in a few days. So did you have a comment, Ruben? Nope. Goodbye. Oh, goodbye. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. Happy New Year. Stay Thank healthy. Thank you, happy. Gail. Excellent we're, job. We're going to get together in person in the next couple of months. Be, be sure of that. And just take care of yourselves. Be healthy. And hope to see you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.